guess you could say, is that he has trained and coached people. And now by the, the grace of God, there's over 12,000 different groups in various parts of the United States and Central America and South America and even Cuba. And so we're really excited to have Hermie on the, the call and for him to really uh, just share with us some of the, the knowledge, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I guess you could say, Hermie, over the years, because they've definitely paved a path for a lot of us. So I want to just ask Hermie, first of all, to just share his journey towards DMM, and that would also include his experience at City Team. Thank you for the invitation to, uh, yeah, to share my story and and it's been a it's been a remarkable story. I had no idea, you know. Uh, I've been with City Team 17 years, and yeah, when I really felt God called me there, but I had no idea that God's gonna uh, allow me to experience the experiences that I had. Um, uh, like I said, 17 years ago, I started at City Team as um, just managing our, our warehouse. Um, City Team is kind of based out of out of San Jose, and we're, we've been around for 60 years uh, this year. And we're known for work we do with homeless, uh, serve the homeless. We also um, help people in addiction with our recovery ministry. And the department I was I started off and later become the team leader of is where we serve low low income families, kind of the working poor out in the community. And um, believe it or not, Silicon Valley has has hundreds and thousands of these these families that live uh, at or below the poverty line and um, so we served a lot of people and I think you know uh, on on if you look at our stat sheets we're um, we're actually quite successful at doing that um, even at our large events we had a lot of people you know we had like um, a gospel message go out in English Spanish and Vietnamese and over the course of a year, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people will raise their hands and they make saving decisions to, to start to follow Christ. What we saw is that we found a lot of people that are spiritually open. What we also saw more and more and more is that people are not, uh, the, the, the very next step, once they identify them as open or even willing to follow Christ, going to a, 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 a church, an existing church, was a step too far. Um, these people come from a Catholic culture, so there's some barriers. Uh, people with a Buddhist culture have some barriers. And um, even those, so we started working with churches, started giving them the goodies, and we just found that there were there are many barriers um, to reach the whole family. Maybe the wives would come, and the churches weren't really growing. They would get to about 100 and 150, and then kind of get stuck there. So, um, and just more and more, we were convicted. Even the Great Commission was in our mission statement. We were not doing a good job at making disciples. And even if you really read the Great Commission, it's about making disciples and make disciples and make disciples. So that's when David Watson started training us in 2005, 2004, somewhere around there. And uh, so about three years into, into our ministry. And um, yeah, it, I got really excited and overwhelmed at the same time. The challenge was all of us come from a traditional church background and we had this this traditional spiritual muscle memory that's based on addition and not multiplication so we did not understand multiplication we did not understand how to really launch movements what is our job what's god's job and what is their job so constantly we would go into over doing things that they should be doing for themselves we would do that for them some of the things god should be doing we should uh, create the space where God does the teaching and the and the correcting and all of that we would do that and all of this does create dependencies on us and the outsiders and it and it hinders multiplication so needless to say in the first three years we didn't quite see the results we wanted to see um, we had three major restarts I mean of that is we would start a bunch of groups after like say a, a Thanksgiving Christmas event we would see like 50 groups starting and um you know nine ten twelve months later they're not multiplying um if you pull out the the key the the person who helped start it the group kind of like doesn't continue so we're like oh man or some continue but they um 
just didn't have the right DNA. So then we're like, okay, well, let's restart. And uh, we'd start another bunch. And, and it was really, really challenging. Um, during that time, actually, a third of the staff at City Team quit. We either left or was asked to leave. So you can just imagine how, how challenging that time was. But then we started getting coaching. And I, we can talk a little bit later on that. And really a guy named Dave, uh, um, Joe Hernandez really started to help us focus on the principles, help us understand the principles, and really let us just implement it according to the book and not because we wanted to make changes. And he just said, you know, frankly, you are not qualified to make any changes. We're going to, we're going to do a kind of like a, 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 a case. Um, we're going to do some, some experiment. Uh, what do you call it? Not a case study. We're going to go according to the book and then do enough so we can see how that works. And then we'll make minor adjustments, but without violating the principles. And that really, really helped us. And then we started to see, oh, this is, this is our role. This is God's role. This is their role. We started to identify persons of peace and really, um, really let them uh, replicate us in them and them and others. And, and it just started taking off and then almost too fast. So um, it literally started exploding. I mean... God started doing so many miracles, so many healings, so many things that we just had a, a, a really difficult time keeping up. Um, and that led to the last restart in about 2012, where we got good at starting groups and, and getting the, some of that right DNA in there. But we still didn't quite know how to really develop leaders and teams. And if you call, or probably another term is elders elders in these of these these groups of these streams and um so uh and and then also really to have enough uh mentoring and accountability so that led to the last restart and we just keep learning every time and and um yeah and then you know our areas the people all of the people from the world pretty much live in the silicon valley so uh Multiplication is baking from the beginning. So we just started spilling out to other areas, other cities, other countries. Now it's in more than 15 different countries. There's, there's, there's work happening. Um, and our team have significantly invested in Mexico, Central America, um, and also Cuba. This is just me and Ricardo. This city team has, has, uh, uh, are, uh, and other leaders are investing in others. But it's not like we've gone there. It's people have, have taken it there. and. It's just incredible to see the transformation that's taking place in the lives of, of, of people and even how fast people mature and, and the power of replication. In some places, whole towns are being transformed. And I just love to see, yeah, who God uses. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit about just the, the change within the whole idea of what success is, your definition of success over the years? Yeah, so, you know, even, I mean, our mission statement, we've, we've actually changed our mission statement once we've, we've gone on this DMM journey, um, where it had to be less about, you know, just the Matthew 25 type of stuff, you know, serving the least of these. Clearly, clearly God cares about that, you know, but, and, and we still continue to do that wholeheartedly. But we, we had a look at it's less about how many food boxes, how many families were served, how many, how many toys was given out during Christmas. Um, it's also less about how many people got saved, how many people made professions uh, of faith. We had to measure how many disciple-making communities are, 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 are launched, discovery groups. And then we really started looking at um, how many are multiplying. We wanted to launch streams that multiply up to the third and the fourth generation. So we had to um, change the way we track. We had to change the, the, you know, a little bit. We've, we still celebrate those other things, but um, if for a while it was almost like that doesn't matter unless it's lead to disciples that make disciples that make disciples. So uh, that was hard for many people because you join an organization that's all about meeting felt needs, a compassion ministry. And 
some people is like, well, I, I don't, you know, this is what, what they feel like God has called them to do. So um, I, I think there's still a place for that. And that leads to, to building relationships. It leads to having spiritual conversations and disciple making. But um, we just really had to change change our definition to not even make disciples, but really make disciples and make disciples. For me, I want to backtrack a little bit. Um, you mentioned that you guys started with Compassion Ministry, and think I think City Team started back in the 1950s. So they did Compassion yeah, Ministry. 57. 1957, and yeah. they did Compassion Ministry forever, and. They, I think they read Good to Great, if I'm correct on that. And they're like, wow, we're doing a lot of good things, but we want to do some great things, and that's to make disciples. But originally, the plan was to do compassion ministry and then connect people with the local church. And why did you find that difficult to do within people that were coming to the compassion ministries? Yeah, because, I mean, it's, it's, it's deeply relational. So, you know, that whole compassion ministry it, it established relationship, established trust. And trust is not transferable. Um, you know, okay, you can somewhat vouch for someone, um, but when there's, a, when, when there's a connection, it's like, okay, now go to this other entity for the, for the spiritual aspect. And just in our area, I don't know other cities, but Bay Area um, is really not, I mean, pretty much the West, but the Bay Area is really the least... Uh, is the area with the least biblical view. It's the area with the the, the most unchurched and de church people. So um, now to go and there's there's some barriers, mm. you know, to going to a church, a Christian church, you know, in this community, and some were not understanding of their culture. So it just was too big of a cultural and a, a relational jump. So that was not successful. Mm-hmm. So we just started working rather with, with churches and we saw the churches grow. And actually today we still, most of our new growth is partnership with churches, existing mm-hmm. traditional churches that, ha- that are kingdom minded, that really is, is not just about pastoring a congregation and filling up my church to get to three services, but really how can we start to pastor our, our neighborhood? How can we pastor our city? And, uh, and they are so kingdom minded that even if it's about really seeing the great commission and the kingdom of God come to earth, uh, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that they don't care if these people will come to their church or not. And it's okay if that form of church that emerged out in that apartment complex or that community center, even over that cemetery, whatever, uh, looks a little different, it takes a different form. So we just help churches and pastors kind of um, uh, look at discovering these these principles and these strategies from from a lot of the life of christ and uh the bible and then to really start to wrap their arms around their neighborhood to see the great commission fulfilled there um i know that a lot of us are starting groups or we're being you know, beginning to engage our communities. Uh, could you go into a little bit more depth and just share some of the mistakes that you've seen um, over the years and maybe give us a little bit of an idea of things that we need to watch out for as we launch groups? Sure. Yeah, man, I read the parable, you know, you read the Bible many times and, you know, we love the parable of the sower. And you see, it's only that fourth soil that really reproduced 30, 60, 100 fold, right? So, um, we were focused on finding that fourth soil. And, you know, if groups didn't multiply, I blame the soil. I used to, at least. And um, I'm more and more convinced, okay, we're not going to blame the seeds. because That's the word of God. But um, I think, just in my experience doing this more and more, um, it's, it's, it's sometimes less about the soil and more about the farmers. You know, um, you can have good soil, you can have good seed, but you still need to, need to water they still need to do some things to uh, to really see that that this the soil reproduce. And I just find that a lot of times we've turned some really good soil uh, sterile. And how we did that was, you know, a lot of times it's just we we say we have to go slow to go fast. So this there's, there's a couple of ways that that plays out for for us in our area. Um, one of the areas, you know, we 
it's just in the mechanics of facilitation and how you start the group. Sometimes we're, we're too fast to go too formal too quickly. And, you know, we would meet a family. We would find that they, they are spiritually curious. This would be through our compassion ministry. And then we were too eager to start groups to get it to, okay, now, you know, come in and, and, and really, yeah, they said yes, but it's not a relationship yet. Yet It's not that level of trust. It's not that. So kind of need to slow it down. And then when people are, are ready to take that, so sometimes we just got to pray with them. We got we to gotta spend time with them. We got to have spiritual conversations before we start that discovery group, that formal side of a, of a discovery group. And then when we start the formal side of the discovery group, I just found that, you know, many times we facilitate too well. At least I did many times before, you know. Um, you know, facilitation is a bit of an art. And, you know, you want to do it entertaining. And, you know, and sometimes people have questions. And I, um, but yeah, so I just facilitated too quick, uh, too well and with too much charisma. So when I want to have them facilitate, they felt like, man, I, I can't facilitate it as well as Hermie does. Mm -hmm. So that becomes a barrier to, to multiplication because I want them to own that. Mm -hmm. Or when they ask questions, you know, we would answer the question for them. Instead of uh, asking, hey, what do you think? Let the question, let, let it bounce around. So I don't set myself up as a subject, subject expert. Because what people are afraid to start a discovery group or any Bible study for that matter is, man, what if, what if they ask me questions I don't know? I don't want to be look stupid and I don't want to screw people up spiritually. I don't want to tell them the wrong thing. So that's what I love about discovery group. You don't need to. It's just let, let, let scripture and the, God and, and the Holy Spirit teach. You just, we just create this environment where God can do the teaching. Um, so the other thing is also just, um, I think we, we, we didn't know how to develop teams and, 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 and yeah, really start these groups, but we, we got to mentor and coach the leaders. Mm -hmm. And then we got to bring them into, you know, communities. We kind of kept it so small, deliberately for multiplication's sake. But then I would get feedback also from our folks. It's like, man, Ricardo would say, Hermie, our, our Latinos, man, we love to gather. We, they, they, they want more than just that small, you know, one or two families coming together. So uh, we were a little bit, it's like, no, 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 we don't want this to turn into a traditional church and things like that. We heard things like once they get a building, they stop multiplying. So we're like, okay, we're not even going to go there. But people need more interaction with others on the same journey. So, um, um, and I think the groups that really, kept together long term was they added new members over time and they're the ones also starting others and there was community with other people in that neighborhood that's on that same journey so there's some cross-pollination there's some other other voices also speaking into this and really for a neighborhood trans to transform it really takes a team mm -hmm. and there's different gifts that come to play so mm -hmm. really then launching these these, com these leadership communities or these teams that function like a church, a larger church, maybe like 20 or more people, and they start to wrap their arms around that, that neighborhood. And, and that's been really powerful on the, on the sustainability and the, and, the, and the going deeper. So these are lessons we've, we've learned, and I think that um, that is really, um, yeah, Took a while to figure out, but uh, but yeah, I think uh, that they're really valuable. I want to mention that we're going to have some time at the end just for people to ask questions. Um, so I'm not the only one that's asking the questions, but I wanted you to talk a little bit about that change in muscle memory. People tend to kind of go back to the old way of doing things, and it, that whole idea of changing paradigms is very challenging. Could you speak a little bit to that, Hermy? Yeah, sure. I mean, a lot of times, you know, you all have gone through the training and, and it makes sense here. I mean, they, we all have these aha moments and sometimes that feel like, um, okay, now that I, now that I know, I mean, David, you've, you've uh, <laughs> had people, I think, r ride that, that reverse bicycle, the backwards bicycle. So, um, 
you know, uh, for us, it was, we were, grew up in riding a conventional bicycle. The teachings of Jesus is, is counterintuitive. And it's not just the teaching, it's, it's really this, this strategy, this, this way of life and going about making disciples that multiply. That was, uh, for us, like riding a, a backwards bicycle. So just knowing it, but when we go out and, and do it, we would just, it would just, we would just revert. So we would start answering questions. We would go into kind of like teaching, preaching mode without even knowing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, some of those things. So, so for us, it was really, we needed coaching. We needed someone. It's, I, I look at the best, the best golfer. You know, you can kind of still have a coach, someone that kind of like observe that, that can kind of pick up some things and help us. And, and I think, you know, we can do some peer coaching and things like that. But in the beginning, David trained us, but he lived in, in Texas and he was still very much involved in international um, uh, church planning movements and disciple making movements, launching that. Mm -hmm. So he would train and then he would leave. And, you know, we were kind of like on our own. And we do not know of anybody else in the United States that, that we could get coaching from. So we would make mistakes and do it repeatedly. And sometimes, you know, then David Watson would come 10 months later and I would go through another training and I would pick things up or I would discuss and it's like, oh, well, you do this. And sometimes I would tell him, you did not train this last time. He says, I can show you. It's in the PowerPoint. I'm like, wow, okay. So kind of that coaching really helps with making not only just making the mind shifts, but really how to, how to really live it out um, and, and make it new muscle memory. You uh, obviously coach a lot of people. Could you talk a little bit more about just the content and the process of coaching? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm just, I'm passionate about coaching because I believe that, um, you know, it, it was just such a different maker, difference maker for, for all of us. Mm -hmm. And um, I've known that we've gone through a season where, again, we kind of measure training and how many people have gone through training because that's kind of easy to get on a spreadsheet. And I think training is important. Mobilize people. We need to equip people. But if it's training without really a follow-up strategy of coaching, you know, um, then it's – it's not that effective. I mean, you're going to get a few people that's really going to stuck with it and kind of figure it out. But for a lot of people, they're going to try it for a while and then it's not going to work. They're not going to see the results. And six months later, they're going to try something else. And many times I've seen people quitting quote unquote DMN. Yeah, I've tried it. It doesn't work. And you really talk they they, they, they didn't do, uh, well, they didn't really apply all the principles. And, uh, and, and usually there was also not, not effective coaching and, and a long enough period of actually doing the big low ground work to really see the above ground results. Yeah. Cause, um, it's, it's going to take a while. And I, I think, you know, you're going to need, you're going to need someone to, that's going to partner with you, that someone that's going to become your friend, someone that you know, that. That, that has your best interest, someone that's a, a few steps ahead of you, that a lot of it is, I've, I found coaching, a lot of it is encouragement. You know, um, um, it's, it's physical encouragement, it's spiritual encouragement. When we step out to do this, to, <laughs> to uh, really see the kingdom of God established in our city, there are forces, powerful forces that does not want you to succeed. And, you know, you're going to need, you're going to need a supportive community around. You're going to need people praying for you. Um, you're going to need people in, uh, encouraging you. So coaching is a lot of encouragement, mm -hmm. sharing stories, sharing just that this person doesn't feel, man, I'm alone. Um, mm -hmm. This person also, if, if they come from a traditional background, uh, many other people are not going to understand quite what, he or she is doing so um sometimes you're gonna feel like man i don't know if, uh, so to have that coach uh really helps us like to stay in the game and no i'm not crazy this is this is biblical and and, and so on 
<clears throat> so I think there's that's there's some of that 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 content, you know. But I think it, there's also just the process of someone that's that's that you're gonna talk. In the beginning, you know, it's gonna be a little more intense. You may talk twice twice a week, you know, and there may be seasons two three times. There may be um, those people that that you're coaching. You're gonna go visit them if like I'm coaching David, you know. Um, it's more than just talking about DMM, you know, we go quadding, you, 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 you talk about your family, you talk about a lot of other things, mm -hmm. talk about cooking and things like that. We spend time together. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, we pray together and stuff like that. Um, but my goal is to replicate myself into, into you. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, I don't want you just to know what I know, but I want you to do what I do and do it better than I do. And, um, and then you do the same in others. So we need to multiply trainers. We need to multiply coaches. We need to multiply mentors. Um, and then we can also, because these are the mobilizers, these are the people I look to invest in, these catalytic leaders that's going to establish these team of disciple makers that's going to then replicate in grassroots leaders and disciple makers and, and elders. I know that when you started coaching me, Hermie, one of the most important things was just encouragement. And early mm -hmm. on, it's, it's challenging. A lot of times you feel like you're, you're building a boat and you're just hoping that the water will come. And I remember several times just calling you and going, man, this isn't working or, or I just feel yeah. like I want to give up. And yet at the same time, I was thinking, where else am I, you know, what else am I going to do? Because these principles that I've learned are a part of me and i remember calling you a lot early on and just saying i'm a little discouraged today and oh, yeah. it was just really helpful to have that connection and then also just the relationship i mean i would have to say that hermes is one of my best friends and it started out by just hanging out together and we both love atv riding and he's taught me how to to cook um, Hermie's a good chef, <laughs> a good uh, smoker, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he's good at cooking meat. So we really, Barbecue. <laughs> so, and, and when he comes to town, I mean, he stays in, in my house. When I go to San Jose, I, I stay with him. And so there's just a real bond that's taken place and it's just been real vital. It's been a lifeline for me. Um, yeah. And I think, I think really to, because it's such a relational uh, thing and, and coaching is essential. I look at, you know, uh, I get requests from, from churches or groups to, to train and, uh, you know, I look at, uh, do they have coaching available in their area? And, you know, it'd be best to, to kind of like, okay, you can, you can learn something from us but I'd like you to really get coaching if, if that's in that context there. Uh, or if, 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 if that's not available, then, you know, we're almost, I look at, you know, if I'm going to invest in training, I need to have like a, an inside champion that, that I'm going to start coaching long-term for this to succeed. Now, you know, you don't know if that's going to pan out, but at least the intention is there and someone is, 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 is willing to, yeah, I would love to, this is going to be a long-term commitment. It's going to take a while. We're okay with that. We're not, it's not just going to be a nine month commitment to try it out. Uh, we're expecting to launch a movement in nine months. Um, it doesn't always work out, but at least now if I'm going to train in a, with a church or someone, I'd like to have a, uh, someone that's going to, there's the intention of launching a team and there's going to be a, an already designated team leader with the blessing of the senior pastor that's gonna that's gonna lead this this team um so but again you know you spend a lot of time with these people uh so it better be some relational chemistry yeah ministry is hard enough already so if you don't get along with this person it's probably not gonna work so um but then make sure that this person uh or this team actually has someone that can coach coach them but uh, if, if it's not going to be you, try to connect them with someone else. Yeah. One of the first times I met David Watson, I heard him say that, that training without mobilization is a waste of time. 
And I'd have to, to say that, that training without coaching is a waste of time also. Um, I, I really feel like it's, it's vital. Um, Hermia, obviously you guys have done a lot of community outreach and community engagement. Um, could you share a little bit more about that? Maybe some of the above and, and uh, below ground work that uh, you've done? Sure. Yeah, so um, kind of like on the area of community engagement, it just, uh, we need to find if God is sending us to a, this area, we feel like, yeah, this apartment complex, this neighborhood, um, yeah, God is sending us. We're looking at expanding in that area. We need to find a legitimate reason to connect with people there. Um, and again, you know, one of the lessons we've learned is um we moved a little too fast we depended on our on our stuff and our community engagement and you know so many times you've gone through the training and they say you know it's prayer is so key it's god that 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 really prepares it's god that does the drawing and all of that and we kind of know that but it wasn't quite a value yet and um so for us community engagement actually starts with prayer um, it's listening, listening to where God wants us to go. Um, and, and also just even having, it's on a team level and a strategic level, but also even from our, 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 in our communities, it's, it's developing that spiritual radar, starting to pray for the people where they live, work, learn, and play, and look for opportunities to connect. Um, for us as an organization, community engagement, so uh, prayer, prayer walking, prayer drives. Lately, our teams does a lot of prayer on bicycles. So they would go into teams and two of them would kind of like go around the neighborhood. Some would go from, from west to east, other go from north, south, and just cover this, this community with prayer. You know, once, twice a week uh, for about two to three months. So we feel like, okay, now there's, God has given us the green light or in that process, we already connect with people. You see where people are meeting, you see where people are at. And it doesn't mean that you don't talk to people, but, you know, and then look for, start to look for that opening. In our case, we serve a lot of low income community. So, um, and food is a big part, is a big need of food. So we would do these pantries and, um, and just go and bless people. But as we, as we, before we do that, we try to partner with that person of peace, someone that you could, we would identify even through our, our prayer engagement, you know, and as you ask people about the neighborhood and you start looking for that person of peace, you start looking for that person that many times it's, it's, it's a lady in our, in, in, in our setting. She kind of like knows everybody. She may be a grandma. She may be a young mom. Um, but they know a lot of people in that community. They kind of like care for that community. They know the needs of this community. And when we then identify, we say, yeah, well, you know, we're, we're volunteering with city team and, you know, um, we can, we have access to some food that we can bless some people that are really, really in need, you know, um, uh, but we need, we need help. We need help to find the people that are really in need and, and, and all of that. So the person of peace, many times he or she would just say, yeah, you know, wow, I would love to, I, I can gather the people. Okay. Well, what would that look like? Well, you know, so you start a partner with them and let them do the serving. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and especially when this, so it kind of just, they become that, that bridge into that community. And then as we serve, we develop relationships and all of that. And then later on, they, we wait for them to ask. Why are we doing this? Um, you know, uh, yeah, just developing relationships and, and, and that will lead to, to spiritual conversations. And we just found that many times people are really interested. God's already drawing people. They want to, dis they, they want to have a better life. They, they, there's, some, there's some questions of meaning of life and all of that, or they struggles and, and they're they're open to discover, um, so that's when we give invitations to discover, and start these discovery groups. Um, Hermie, I've heard you talk a lot about spiritual snacks. Uh, could you just sure. explain that a little bit and how those 
really help in the process? Yeah, so I got this this thing from, um, there's actually a book by Doug Pollock, it's called God Space. And that's where, where that, and I, I can highly recommend, it's, it's really a, uh, a neat book. Um, but a lot of times, you know, in the beginning, we used to call this Shema statements. That's out of Deuteronomy 6. And it's just, how do we make these statements that indicate that we love and obey God? So um, it's not, so it's just, you know, we want to put some of these snacks out when they just a spiritual snack. So um, when somebody, you know, and this is best in, when, when people know you, when you get in contact, uh, when you're in relationship, maybe in the marketplace or, uh, or with your neighbors or things like that, when they just, when you have conversations, you know, how do you, how do you just let them indicate that you love and you follow Christ? Um, you have a relationship with Christ and it may be something, I, I like it just something real. So if, if it's, you know, I remember um, a lot of times when you meet people in our neighborhood, you know, it's kids and we talk about that and I may just say, yeah, you, you know, um, yeah, uh, just what a blessing our, our, our child has been, you know, our, our journey to having children has been, um, has been a long one that really required. Yeah. has been a long one. And then they may ask, oh, oh, really, what, what, why is that? And then I may share with how we struggle with infertility and then really how we had to trust God, you know, in this process. And this may even sound weird, but God even gave me visions, even gave me a, a picture of my son and, and gave me the name uh, before he was even born. And sometimes, you know, that, then they would ask more and then that can lead to sharing a little bit of my testimony. And the goal is not to close the deal and get them, get them saved right there. And then if they ask, I found that they would ask up to a certain point and then they would kind of back off and that's okay. I'm going to see them again, maybe a week or two later. And, um, the other day, my, uh, you know, one of my neighbors, he, he, he asked, he, he said, so you work at a church or something, right? And this is just from seeds planted. And, I said, well, kind of. So I explained again what I do and how I help. And, and he's been actually really, really curious. Um, and he actually started going to a church close to his work uh, where they do a Bible study. Um, but it's just kind of like these seeds planted. Um, but, so it's not about, it's really how do we put something out that's, going on in our lives it's not kind of cheesy or things like that but um wait for people to ask to respond to hear more and um and and then it gives us opportunity to share a little bit of our testimony awesome well i want to open it up for other people to ask questions we have about maybe 15 more minutes and so if you have a question uh, feel free to to go ahead and ask her me And make sure you take yourself off mute if you can. Yeah, Hermie. Um, I've got an opportunity. Um, I'm, the, I'm the chair of the Four Tucson uh, Poverty Reduction Task Force. And I've been having some meetings with different people uh, in order to do community uh, outreach and community um, you know, transformation. Uh, what, what kind of people you talk, and I, and I understand like you need different kinds of people for different aspects so that you have a team who's going to work together to invest in that community. What, uh, what are some of the key, key personalities and types of people you need on a team? Mm, that's a great, great question. Yeah, I think, um, you know, so as I look at some of the teams that we have in the Bay Area, I think um, it's it's help. It's one of the key key people in an area is that catalytic leader, someone that kind of sees the big picture, someone that can 
that is that is investing in these teams, you know, um, and provide some provide some training and and really some some strategic support. Um, you don't need every team don't need a catalytic leader, you know, you don't need two hundred catalytic leaders or or a thousand catalytic leaders for for uh, for Phoenix. So I don't know what what city you're in, um, but then at that team. Um, there's a couple of gifts I see that's really helpful. Um, some of that that really have a have a passion and an ability to connect with people as you go into into a new community. So let's say this person has a little bit of the gift of evangelism or that apostolic gift. Um, so they yeah they can connect with people and they can easily and have spiritual conversations also that's that's just kind of normal you know pe people usually open up spiritually pretty easily to them also so they can find those people that are spiritually curious um i found a lot of times these people they are very gifted at, at finding these persons of peace um and there's other people that are not so gifted but they the people that are gifted at finding persons of peace many times they find lots of persons of peace and they don't have the bandwidth to to really spend the time and really help launch the group, really disciple this group. So you need to pair them up with someone that's more of that shepherd, that pastoral gift. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I found that that these people they need the person they find the person's a peace, and the person's a peace person find the need these people to really start these groups well. And there's a, a, they need to work, really work together to really, so that the, it, it's not an awkward relational handoff. Yeah. We also see that um, the gift of, of hospitality is also really helpful for, we have a group, like in our team, there are usually uh, a, quite a few people that just love to host, they love to cook, they love to Man, when outsiders come, they just feel loved by these people. And they serve them, they just honor them, and they just like, wow, this is really a loving community. I feel like, man, I belong here. Because a lot of times churches, you kinda have the you kinda have enough of the right beliefs coupled with enough of the right behaviors, how you look, how you dress, how you act and all of that, and then you can belong. You know, where in DMM, we look at, we plant the gospel in communities where people already belong. And then you kind of work from that sense of belonging, you address the beliefs and you address the behaviors. So, but in, in, in these teams, you know, sometimes you've got to create these environments where people just feel welcome. And people with that gift of hospitality, they're, they're just really good at that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> taking care of that. So I think having those key ingredients um, can really help start. And then you don't have to have all of all of the right, but I think you need about three or four of those. Um, a catalytic person coupled with someone that's, that's gifted at opening new communities, at finding persons of peace, someone that can really um, follow up and like tag along with that person and, and really establish the groups well. And um, a lot of times the gift of hospitality comes from that team once these groups are launched and that you launch that inside team to really go and, 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 and how do you now plant a team that's going to reach this whole, this whole neighborhood. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Sure. Hey, Hermie, you mentioned... Uh, I think for lack of a, I forget exactly what phrase you used, but like the like spiritual strongholds that we have, like opposition or whatnot. Um, what kind of experience do you have? Have you got, like specifically addressing that or identifying that, or you know, we talked about prayer a little bit, but could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So maybe the kind of maybe that that that's what we like to do: prayer drives and and even prayer walks and prayer bicycle rides. And you kind of get a sense, especially if you're on a bicycle, uh, you're, you're 
somewhat in, inside the community or you, you, you do some prayer walking, you get a sense of what's going on. And so to kind of look with your physical eyes, but also with, uh, with your spiritual eyes, what's going on in this community. And you also talk to people. So you get a sense of what, what is the, what's the strongholds? What are the, the things that we need to pray against? And what are the things we need to pray for? We need to see, to see the kingdom come to this, to this neighborhood. Um, and, and yeah, the Bible says, you know, uh, first tie the strong man before you go into the house. And once he's tied, you can go in the house and take whatever you want. Um, then there's also, so there's that aspect of, of kind of like praying over this area. Um, and then also we find that when many times when people start this journey of starting to, to discover, um, their lives become harder. Mm. You know, there's a lot of opposition. Sometimes there's even demonic signs. Um, we work with people with addiction. Uh, we work with people that come from various backgrounds. And, and I mean, we've had certain things that can only be described as, as demonic. Mm. So we have to then not only cover them in prayer, but we need to teach them how to fight uh, uh, spiritually. So, uh, and it's been, it's been, it's been fun. It's been interesting. Um, yeah, to see that. And when someone that has never read the Bible, um, you know, someone that still has very savory language, when that person rebukes the devil in the name of Jesus with, with spiritual authority, they're not going to use Christianese. They're going to use some pretty, a lot of profanity, which is, uh, <laughs> which can be, it can be interesting, and uh, but it's just it's just amazing. I mean, God honors that, and and it's really that hard. Um, so, so yeah, a lot of times we actually need to teach people those things before where we even thought, wow, this is going to be this is something for a mature believer. These people have not even quote unquote um, they haven't even got baptized, and they need to they need to start to uh, fight first. You mentioned the like teach. Is, is this are you talking about like more through like your one on one discipleship or coaching that you're that you're kind of teaching these principles to the people? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's part of like seeing them, letting them discover some of these principles from the Bible, and then model for them. So we like to use a discovery and then you know also model for them. Um, I mean, there was yeah even. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so I think some of it, and it's even some cases where, yeah, people had, there's a lot of demonic activity, and um, like Ricardo had to do this over the phone, help them, not pray for the person, but help them, and they tried, they started working on that, and, and yeah, it's just amazing how, um, how God shows up, you know, but I think, let them discover, model for them, um, and then, you know, continue to kind of help them grow in that. Thanks. Sure. Uh, Hermie, can I ask a question if we have enough time left? Mm -hmm. um, you talked about uh, early on in your talk, you talked a little bit about impacting the community and uh, uh, I think a lot of us are from vineyard churches and could you just talk a little bit about the tension between, you know, working with a uh, kind of a branded group, a, a denomination, and also trying to work with the larger community of Christ. Yeah. So I think similar to how we look for persons of peace, we're kind of looking for pastors of peace, you know, um it's some of those pastors are are really have a have a desire to see you know the the kingdom established in their in their city um and there is a level of, of frustration also with mm -hmm. kind of like the results there that, that they are seeing and uh we're willing to try something different so i think we'll look for those type of type of type of churches that that we can partner with, and they're open. They're open to both models of of or forms of church, the attractional 
church and also this kind of like this grassroots um, BMM style of church. Uh, so those are the people we look for to partner with. And um, yeah, I, I, I think part of it is they got to translate it into their, their language. Um, a lot of the training and, 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 and the leading of this is actually done from from someone and we work with a lot of Latino churches, so they're a lot smaller. So um, the pastor actually does quite a bit of this, um, usually himself, but there's a few female female pastors also. And um, but yeah, we try to really, so it's not necessarily just a program, it's more of a lifestyle, help them also discover these principles. And then I think just, Coaching is really, really critical there. Mm -hmm. And not only coaching by someone, uh, but also then having these, these peer coaching groups of pastors mm -hmm. where, you know, and that's what David does. I mean, that's what this call is about. Um, and I think that is really, really helpful to let pastors come together. And, and sometimes they need to, especially in the beginning, um, have a place where even the key member, their, their, their congregation is not part, where they can freely speak about these things and their challenges. And, um, but yeah, peer learning, peer learning groups, because um, it's a, it, it, it is a bit of a challenge. And then we find that a lot of the first generation groups that our partner, church partners start, has a bit of a, a, a hybrid DNA. Um, and, and that's okay. They kind of look a little bit more like a, there's a little bit of that traditional uh, uh, DNA in there or form in there. And also many of these groups, even though it's not the strategy, but many of these groups end up actually uh, become part of the, that congregation. We just encourage the pastor that they, these people then not just become just regular church members, but they become part of the, that, that go team and because many of their friends and family are still on church and they got that relationship and they got that, that, that DNA in them. So um, they become very effective people that are starting, starting new groups out in the community. And we found, you know, second and third generation um, have a little bit less of that traditional uh, DNA. Many times it also sp spreads out to, where it's not realistic for them to now come to church because it, it may be a little too far of a drive and all of that. But mm -hmm. Then they start looking at, okay, how can we develop the leaders? And my church is not just a, a, a gathering with a, with a congregation, but it be, also becomes an equipping center. And it becomes a, a center which is more for the community. So even when there's quinceaneras need to be take place or you know, parties or this or that, use that facility, that facility becomes a pantry, it becomes a, a clothing closet and, you know, and not just happening there, but also things happening in the community. Mm -hmm. So um, it becomes that beachhead to really see the kingdom established in that community. And obviously that, that, that does take time to kind of get there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the challenge is that you, <clears throat> if, if a lot of people are going to leave and get upset about this, the, the church is going to close, so w we try to tread lightly and, and kind of like start a little bit of a skunk works. Still continue, the church still continue, but you start to have the people with the desire to go out and start to train them and, and, and kind of release them. Mm -hmm. uh, but for many, many people, it's not this radical shift. Oh, we're doing DNM now, and we're now a DNM church and all of that. It, it's not that. It's more... Mm -hmm. It's more you have this team, and they would start hearing the stories, and later on, later on, more and more get involved. And, mm -hmm. and but even the the come side still stays very similar; it doesn't change a whole whole lot yeah. uh, for many. Hermie, I wanted to say thanks for taking the time to do this this morning. Sure, and it's been really really helpful. Um, we're recording this, and so I'll send it out to everyone so you can share with other people on your team. And again, thank you, Hermie, for doing this. And I was wondering, Hermie, if you could just uh, pray for all of us as we begin this journey. I would love to. Thanks. It's been, it's been a real honor. And yeah, Lord, I thank you for 
I thank you for this group. Lord, I thank you for this team, God. I thank you what you are doing, um, not only in the Vineyard Movement, but I know there's some other other churches also part of uh, part of this team. And God, I I thank you for these pastors of peace, Lord. These pastors that um, really that you've you've given a a deep passion, a deep desire to not only for them to follow you, but to bring others along. That have a deep desire, Lord, to see your kingdom come, your will be done in their city, in their neighborhood, as it is in heaven. Lord, we believe that um, that there is um, just so. You went on mute for just a second, Hermie. Go ahead and repeat that. <laughs> Your um, yeah, when when we see people just just start follow you, and God, I pray that you would give each one favor, Lord, that you would give them. Um, I pray for victories. I pray for breakthroughs, Lord. I pray that um, that you will add to their numbers, add to their teams, God. I pray that you would just connect those men and women of peace. Some are very old, some are very young. God, I pray that you will connect them to these disciple makers. Lord, we pray for divine connections. God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them, that they would know that beyond a shadow of a doubt that God Almighty is, is with them. The kingdom has come near and that everyone has access, direct access to, the, to you, Lord, to not only know you, but to be known by you and to, to follow you and to be to be a uh, part of your family. So God, I pray that, that that love and that transformation will multiply, Lord. And our cities will start to look different. Um, God, I pray that you would do the type of uh, transformation and multiplication we see in Africa and Cuba and other parts, Lord, that that would come to the United States. God, we pray that, that um, it would just be, um, yeah, just, that stats even on, on, on divorce and crime and, and greed and all those things will go down as people just start to love and obey you. I pray that you would use this group um, uh, to, to do that and to multiply into others. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hey, thanks for joining this call, and I'll keep you updated with uh, future calls. But uh, just great to talk with everyone, and it's great to have Hermie on the call. And so we just wish you a, a wonderful day. Thanks. God bless you all. Thank you.